going to start by being open about why I'm here, uh, what, what my goal is. Um, so my, my, my goal in speaking to uh, people who are in energy societies and climate societies and that kind of thing in universities is to kind, kind of pitch for people going into entrepreneurship and specifically into climate entrepreneurship. Um, I, I think this is um, a, a very exciting and potentially really profitable space to, to be in. Um, and also it's something that the world really, really needs at the moment. That's, that's what I hope to, to get out of this. I, I hear that you're probably already all entrepreneurs. So maybe what I'm going to be pitching for is you guys considering climate um, as, as a way to go. Um, so I was going to talk a little bit about um, what I'm doing right now. So to so my Climate VC fund and Climate VC in general in the UK and in Europe. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about how I got here because um, I took quite an unusual route. Then I was going to you know, do, do my pitch for you guys to go to uh, consider climate entrepreneurship as a, as a way to, to go um, and then do an AMA where you can literally ask me anything and uh, I, I may answer it. Um, so if you've ever wanted to ask a climate VC uh, anything, then this, this is your opportunity. How does that sound? Is that, is that what you guys turned up for? Yeah, some tentative nods of the head, cautiously nodding the heads. Okay, that's good, that's good. Um, what, uh, so I'm just gonna pick somebody at random and ask why did you turn up and what you're hoping to get out of this event? We're not gonna go around the whole room. Uh, Lewis or Louis? Uh, yeah, I guess uh, my natural inclinations towards um, finance, so particularly as a VC aspect of it, and sort of how you you channel capital and to which to which investments you would you choose and why, um, and how the how the climate aspects of it sort of uh, link to how uh, how attractive the investment is. Cool. All right. Good. We're both in the right place. Uh, Harrison. Uh, yeah, similar to Louis. I like the idea, or I suppose the philosophy of not only making like positive monetary returns, but also having like positive social returns on what you do. Right, so uh, I was going to talk for about 25 to 30 minutes um, until about uh, about 22 and then do some AMA. Is that is that what you had in mind, Hassan and Meklit? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Sounds good. All right. OK, cool. Um, right. So, yeah, I'm a, um, I recently started a venture capital firm to to fund um, early stage climate entrepreneurs um, uh, as a way of fighting the climate emergency. And that how, how I got into this is that um, I've been working as a CTO for, for a long time. Um, more recently as a consulting CTO where I go into a lot of uh, early stage companies and I help them to build a tech community, a tech capability, um, often with a focus on AI and uh, help them to scale usually from like just a few people in a bedroom to like a, you know, a big um, uh, enterprise. And um, wh what that led me to is I, I I worked on two projects for um, an organization called the Stockholm Environmental Institute. I don't know if you've come across those um, or Greenpeace, you may have heard of those. And uh, the question that they were trying to answer is, right, deforestation, who's funding that? And, um, and are they aware of it? Um, yeah, so I don't know, like who here has heard of the Panama Papers? Panama Papers, right? So it's famous in the UK because um, there's a lot of famous British people who had found found to be doing naughty things financially. Um, they were um, like, for example, starting companies or buying property, things that you'd normally do to, um, that would require you to pay tax. And they were hiding it around the world by starting shell companies in places like uh, um, the, the Caribbean and, uh, and, and other islands. And um, the, there were a bunch of journalists who used um, graph technology to, to discover um, what all of these connections were. And we discovered that even people like the royal family in the UK had connections to um, people trying to hide money. So terrorists were doing it, gun runners were doing it, um, and you know some of the royal family were doing it. So we used that same technology to discover who's paying for climate change. And it was that that, that kind of brought the, this whole concept of climate change right into, right into the front of my windscreen. And that's when I realized I've got to devote the rest of my life to, uh, to fighting the climate emergency. So what can I do? Um, so I took six months off to, to go and explore some ideas and, uh, you know, I, I did the whole lean startup thing. Are you, who's familiar with lean startup? Probably everyone. If this is the entrepreneurship society, lean startup, it's one, it's one of the great books. Yeah. Find, find a 15 minutes overview of it somewhere. It's uh, if you're thinking about starting a company, you know, it's a, a great way to do it. Anyway, I ran, it, it's all about running experiments. So I ran a bunch of experiments 
interviewed everybody that I could interview, read everything that I could read and realized venture capital is, um, is, is probably what needs to be done. So if, you, if we, so how did we get into this mess where we've got climate change? It's through running the economy in the way that we've been running it. And if we want to have different outcomes, then we need to have, we need to take different steps. So we need to innovate. The world really needs innovation at the moment. Um, and when, when I started it, through my interviewing everybody, I realized there were great entrepreneurs everywhere doing, doing massive things. Um, but the problem space is so huge. You know, there are so many things to do. And so somebody needs to be finding these crazy young startups and investing in them. And so that, that's what I plan to do. So about four months ago, I started that. Um, I, I found a, an investor um, to throw in um, a million. And, uh, and to get us started, I found another partner to, who's already a VC to come and join. And the three of us are, are running this fund. And, and so the plan is that over the, next, over the next year, we'll raise 10 million, which is quite small. So we're not even, we're not even big enough to be called a micro fund at 10 million. Um, but with this 10 million, we plan to invest in um, 100 startups over the next three years. And a bit later on, I'll, I'll just do an overview of the kinds of amazing startups that, that we're seeing. Um, we're, we're, we're building a network with all of the climate VCs um, in Europe. So there's about 95 climate specialized VCs in the world at the moment. Um, and we're, we're building a network with all of the ones in Europe um, and our siblings in, in Germany and Paris are more like hundreds of millions of euros um, rather than my 10 million uh, pounds. Um, so, you know, it's, it's quite a big space. Um, so be, before I did this, as, a, as I said, I was a consulting CTO. Um, I got into that through, um, I just worked my way up from being a developer. So I started a, a company years ago, um, bought Teach Yourself Java in 21 days, um, started a web company, started making websites for people. This is back in the 90s. And after a while, I got recruited by some microsystems. Um, and then after about 15 years of doing that, ended up as a as CTO. But I, I took quite quite a, quite a unique route um, in that when when uh, I went to university uh, like like most people did, but I dropped out after three months and uh, I went to join a band instead. I thought I haven't got time for studying. I want to just be in a heavy metal band. So uh, I joined a heavy metal band and and we toured and we had a great time and it was really fun. But then you know I found myself at, at, at 23 living in Paris with no um, no job and no prospect and I couldn't speak French. Um, so I had to start working in Burger King. And, uh, and so there I was speaking about it because of, my French wasn't good enough to be on the tills. I was mopping the floor. And then there were, you know, I was meeting people like you, your age, who, you know, are exceptional young people with, with loads of great prospects and stuff. So I thought I've got to do something different with my life. And, and that's when I started my first uh, tech company. Um, so two years after that, I was consulting for, for Sun Microsystems. And so my wage went from minimum wage to about 10 times minimum wage um, in the space of about three months. Um, which was, which was nice. I can, I can recommend that. Um, although maybe I won't recommend that. Uh, let's talk about that a, a bit later on. I don't actually recommend that. <laughs> uh, so we'll come to that in a sec. Right. So that, that's, um, that's a little bit about me. I just wanted to give you like an idea of, you know, where I came from in that I've taken a non, a non-direct route and, and ended up in a, in a place similar to people who've got, you know, masters and, and PhDs and things. And one of the themes of this talk actually is going to be, um to get yourself comfortable with taking risk um i one thing so I'm, I'm 47 now and i think one of the big things i've learned um in life is that the, the key to success is to have a, a higher tolerance for risk than usual uh, and so what i'm going to be pitching for is to is putting yourself in an environment where you can tolerate a bit more risk where like emotionally and psychologically you can tolerate a bit more risk but also um that your circumstances are such that you're not you don't suffer you've got a capacity for loss you don't suffer so much um, from risk so that, that's what i'm going to be pitching for um any questions so far no okay so i i think yeah i have a I question we, yeah go so ahead so you were talking about how you uh was you were earning minimal wage in any three months you are making 10 times of that. How did that happen? <laughs> you kind of just like really skipped it. Uh, how did you get yourself together in a sense that, you know, you started a company and form your team, I, I suppose, and get other sort of resources? Was it um, like a great opportunity or just really lucky that happened? Yeah, yeah, it was, it was lucky, it was lucky. Um, and um, 
but I think I think you can manufacture luck. So so what what happened was that I um I was I was working in Burger King earning minimum wage. Um, I saved up some money to do TEFL, so I started teaching English, and so you know my my wage was maybe double minimum wage. I did that for a while, and then I started this company making websites for people. So this was back in the late nineties, when um, when the internet had only just really arrived in France. The internet came late to France for various reasons, um, and so we started making websites for people. But um, and it, and it was quite a good business. Um, we we made e-commerce websites, but um, and I learned this kind of very very um, esoteric language called Java, which now you know it's been very popular, and now it's kind of almost esoteric again. But at the time, it was like in the early days of, of Java, and um, and anyway, in my business, we were we were good at what we did. We were very good at what we did, but we were bad at sales. So my company wasn't very successful. But some microsystems heard that I I was doing this very easy part esoteric part of the language, and they said, "Do you want to come and consult for us?" So I said, "Yes, I do." And that 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 introduction was was purely by fluke. It's because I knew somebody who worked at some microsystems. Um, so. So it was it was a mix of both me taking taking a risk of doing something you know nobody would give me a job as a developer uh, back in the nineties because you know I had no qualifications I've got don't tell anybody this but I've only got four GCSEs to my name that's my greatest qualification I've got four GCSEs so nobody was going to hire me as a developer but I've been running my own development company for two years you know making websites I've, I've made e-commerce websites in the days when not many people were making e-commerce websites. So that's the first thing, you know, I learned something that not many people knew how to do. And the second thing is, I think I'd expanded my surface area of opportunity by just exposing myself to as many opportunities as I could. And when some, when, when they said, do you want to come and consult for us? They didn't know anything about me and I didn't know anything about them. I didn't know what it was like to go into a, an amazing looking building right in the center of London and wear a suit with a tie and go in and, you know, speak to banks and that kind of thing. But... I girded my loins and I went and tried it and I thought, oh, well, I can do it. So I carried on doing it and then voila, 10 years later, <laughs> nobody asked, nobody was asking about my degree anymore. There's, um, there's a word called chutzpah um, from Yiddish, which I really like, which is take risks, be bold, get yourself out there and, and magical things will happen. And I, I, that, that's kind of been, I suppose, that a bit of the theme of my life. Other people call fake it till you make it. Um, I'm, I'm less comfortable with the faking a bit because it's very uncomfortable being found out. Um, but I suppose what, what happened to me is I was, I was good at this very, very niche thing. They needed somebody who was very, very good at this niche thing. And I didn't, nobody asked me any questions about the rest of it. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna press on, but uh, feel free to ask more questions and I'll try and give shorter answers. Um, yeah, so I, I think, I think there's, um, there's a real need right now in, for, for innovation. And I don't know, like who's who's interested in climate change? Is, is it just me? Yeah, a few of us. Yeah, good. Yeah, nice one. Um, it's so I, I decided to devote the rest of my life to, to fighting the climate emergency, and I think it's interesting for a few reasons. One is I do think it's the biggest um, existential threat that has faced mankind so far, um, but I also think it's one of the greatest opportunities we've got. To, to remake the world in the way that we want it to be a world that we want to live in. Um, because we've got to change everything. If you look at what is causing the problem, it's everything, it's agriculture, it's how we move around, it's what food we eat, it's how we produce electricity, how we transport electricity and, and uh, how, we, how we store it. It's the clothes that we wear, you know, it's whether we fly or not. It's, it's, it literally touches on every aspect of our lives and most of that's got to change. So if we're changing everything, then isn't that a great opportunity to make it better? Well, we've got a few thousand years worth of experience. Now that we're changing everything, can, can we take that experience and build it into um, a better world so that, you know, fast forward to 2050, which is the timeline that we're all working to, um, we've got to be net zero. The whole world's going to be net zero by 2050. The world's going to be very different. If it's going to be very different, how about if it's better? And, and I, I look at people like you, you know, the, the bright young minds of the, of the 21st century, um, you know, going to great universities, being part of an entrepreneurial society. And I, I think and many, many like millennials and Gen Z that I meet, they've got a different perspective on, on the world and community than, than, uh, than Gen, Gen X and, and uh, other, other generations have got. So I feel hopeful. I feel hopeful. Um, but if you get, I didn't bring it, but if you get, um, if you get an overview of, of climate change, um, e.g., uh, the Drawdown Project is an amazing place to start. So Drawdown, 
project.org, I think it is. And um, that's the world scientists have got together to say, right, here's, here's all of the things, all of the opportunities that we've got, all of the businesses that need to be created. Wow, it's so many businesses. So if you're an entrepreneur, there's so many things to, to, to get stuck into. Um, and Chamath Palihapitiya, did I say it right? Chamath Palihapitiya, um, who's a famous VC from the States said, um, the world's first trillionaire is gonna be made in climate change. So we've got to change the world. We're being forced into it. Either we change the world or, you know, or humanity is not going to be the same as it was. If we do change it, there's going to be some trillionaires in the world. People are going to make a lot of money. So I think it's a, it's a great opportunity, whether you're interested in saving the planet or whether you're interested in making a lot of money, it's a great opportunity to be in. And now you probably know this too, but now, now is a better time than ever before to be an entrepreneur because there's so much more money in the world than there was even three years ago. Um, so we're right at the bottom of a macroeconomic cycle, and I'm, I'm, I'm speaking like nervously because I know there are econ majors on the on the on the line. But um, you know, it, it, it runs it runs in peaks and troughs, doesn't it? The economy, and we're right at the trough of a, of an economic cycle at the moment, where the only way that we've got of getting out of this mess is for governments to print a whole butt ton of money, and so that's what they're doing. And so there's so much money around, and so you'll see that governments are, are starting innovation. Uh, grants left, right, and centre. They're, they're they're doing economic stimulus and pumping money into the economy. You've got um, investors who are making a lot of money, and then because they've made a lot of money, they've got to pay tax. So now they're looking at reinvesting that money. Everyone who has money is looking to give it away. So if you're looking to start a company, now is a good time. And if you look at VC and um, the amount of deals that are being made and the value of those deals, that's just going up and up and up. So it's a really good time to do it. Um, I've I've also thought, yeah, you know, and I've I've got to get this I've got to get this kind of old man speaking to young people thing in in there. Sonny, listen to my wisdom. Um, really, I, I think it's such a shame when when I look at you know I so I speak to people who've been to Cambridge and LSE and Stanford and um, and great universities, and I look at what their trajectory is, and I know that it doesn't matter how bright they are. In a few years, they're going to be working at KPMG doing spreadsheets, and I think that's such a shame. That's such a shame. They're going to be such little cogs in uh, in such a big machine and not really have any control over you know over much. Um, so I'm I'm very encouraged when I see people like yourselves uh, going the other route, um, because the other route, the entrepreneurial route, where you get yourself out there and you take some risk, there's almost no downside to it. There's almost no doubt. If you want to go to and work for KPMG later, you always can, right? If you can do it as soon as you graduate, you can do it later. There's no downside to doing it. Um, it's harder later on. You've probably heard this from your own parents, but it's harder later on once you've got a spouse, once you've got a house, once you've got kids. You know, it's not impossible. I'm doing it with kids. It's harder. It's harder. I look at my mate Simran, who he, he left Cambridge, um, I don't know, maybe six years ago. And he, he went, he went traveling um, and worked in a bar. And, um, you know, now he's started a couple of companies and he's taken a year off. And he can do that because he's kept... He's kept his outgoings very, very small. And that's just meant that his surface area of opportunity is really big. So when Cambridge University said, oh, hey guys, we're running an incubator. If you're interested in climate change and you wanna start a company, we'll give you some money to live on. And um, it's only a thousand pounds a month. It's not a lot, but we'll give you some money to live on. And we'll introduce you to the best people in the world. And we'll give you some funding at the end of it. Who wants to come and start a company? My mate Sim could say, I wanna do that because I can live on a thousand pounds a month because he'd he'd kept his outgoings really small. So, you know, if, if there's one other piece of advice that, you know, un, unwelcome, unsolicited advice that, that I'd give is beware of lifestyle inflation, right? If you, if you want to be an entrepreneur and you want, to, you want to keep the surface area of opportunity big, then make money your slave and not vice versa, right? Because I know people who, so why, why did I say earlier on, I wouldn't recommend 10Xing your income overnight. Here's why because most people who, who 2X or 3X their income overnight, 2X or 3X or even 4X, they're outgoings. And I don't, I don't know how easy it is to not do that, but I meet, I meet a lot of people who've got, who've got a huge income who actually don't have that much in, in, terms, of, in terms of assets. Um, so you didn't invite me to talk about this, but I just feel I have to get it in. Keep your, if you, if you make money your slave and not vice versa, um, then you will have so much more freedom in your life. And in the UK, this is particularly important because where world leaders are being bad with our money in the UK, 
right? So I worked in this field for, for five years. We were the worst at spending, we're the worst at uh, saving for our pension, and um, we're the worst at saving. And we got the most debt. So anyway, be entrepreneurs and go, in, go into climate change. Let's, let's talk quickly while, um, while we're on the subject of, um, of this to um, about, about the climate space itself. Um, so it, I suppose it doesn't really matter what you're studying. There's some link to what you're, from what you're studying to the climate emergency. And, um, and it's things that if you, if you were to look through the book of, um, of solutions that are detailed in, in the Drawdown book, you'll see things that you recognize like cheap energy, um, uh, marine uh, wind farms and uh, solar panels and that kind of thing. But then you see things which are not so obvious like land use. Right, so that farm, I live near a farm, that farm over there um, is really bad for the climate. Agriculture is really bad for the climate. I wasn't expecting to, to learn that. Um, ooh, thanks a lot, cheers. Cheers. Agriculture is really bad for the planet. Um, finding ways of doing agriculture cheaply in a way that doesn't ruin the planet is big business. And so one, one of the companies that, I'm, that, I, that I love at the moment that I really want to invest in first is a company that measures soil carbon content, shows farmers how to transition to regenerative agriculture, takes the uptick in carbon content and records that on the blockchain that they can then sell for today about $40 a ton, and in three years, $100 a ton, and that's just gonna keep going up exponentially, land. Transport, we know that obviously planes are quite bad for, for your carbon footprint. Um, I, I calculated my carbon footprint and it was about six tons. And then I said, oh yeah, I know I flew to California last year, did a round trip to California. I put that in and immediately my carbon footprint for the year was 12 tons, it doubled it. Right, flying is so bad for, uh, for, for the environment. Um, ships are even worse, but you know what's even worse than both flying and ships combined? Fashion, fashion, the clothes that we wear generate more carbon than maritime and aviation combined. Isn't that wild? That's wild, isn't it? So when, when you speak to people who are into sustainable fashion, um, they recommend um, you know, buy, buying garments and wearing them for longer than you normally would or buying secondhand. And we're starting to see startups who are doing, right, the best climate startups are gonna be crazy, unexpected things. So there's a, there's a startup that allows you to rent out your clothes, uh, <laughs> which sounds wild, right? I, I mean, I've only got three clothes, so I'm not sure anybody would want to borrow any of my clothes, but it's crazy ideas like that that are getting a lot of attention. Um, there's direct air capture. What, do, who would like to take a guess at what the sixth most important, the sixth most productive way of fighting climate change is? <sighs> Educating girls. It's the sixth most, it's, it's higher than solar, solar, uh, solar energy. Can you believe that? So if you're into education, good news. Uh, you, you can be a climate warrior just by going and doing the thing that you're studying to do. Awesome, eh? Right, okay, so what, what, have, we, what have we covered? I'm gonna wrap up in a sec. Uh, we, we covered a little bit about me and my clim climate VC work. I did a quick overview of that. Um, I pitched shamelessly for you people to um, consider going into entrepreneurship and specifically climate entrepreneurship when, uh, when you leave uni um, and yeah, do it while you're long. And then we gave a bit of an overview of the climate space. I can talk more about any of those topics um, or about something completely different, but how about we now move into the AMA part of the, the discussion? That means ask me anything. Um, I've got a quick question uh, regarding like corporate social responsibility. Um, you see lots of these big firms, you know, having an environmental policy. How can you differentiate between greenwashing and actual positive impacts just in the way we interact with companies? So how, how can who tell? How can like custom, uh, yeah. ways customers or? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you're saying fashion is super bad for the environment. So how can me, a consumer, if I went into a shop, how would I be aware whether they truly are sustainable or whether they're just claiming to be? That's, that's a really difficult one. And that, it's kind of an open research question at the moment. The, there are no, no companies measuring this stuff publicly well yet. So what, what we have to rely on is, um, if you look at bodies who, who monitor this, this kind of thing, um, you have to rely on the fact that they've got a statement saying 
we are, you know, so whatever part of ESG you're interested in, if you're interested in the sustainable side of things, do they have a policy that says in what way they are sustainable? And is that publicly available on their websites? Well, that's so basic, isn't it? You'd think, you'd think we could do better than that, but that's one of the main things that these, these bodies look at. Um, so if you look at um, EG Forest 500, they, they've got, um, they've, they've got a, a site that, that looks at companies that use palm oil, for example. Um, have they got a statement on their website that shows um, where they're, that they will only source from sustainable places? That's, that's, that's like, they, they already get a few stars, three stars maybe for just having that. And then there are other bodies that, that will go through everybody who's, up, who's, who's made a public declaration and test kind of on a random basis, does this, does this hold up? So it's not, it's not great at the moment, um, but you've got, and, and so that, you know, that's, that's like a wide open door for anybody who's interested in doing um, startups in, in that area. Um, in, in, some, in some areas like aviation, you know, we've, we know a little bit more because we know how, how much it takes to move a plane of this size from A to B. In things like fashion, it's more difficult. You've got to kind of trust what they say um, while we work out who's going to measure it properly. Um, Patagonia, obviously, you know, is, is really good. So they're very, they're very open about it. Um, but otherwise, it's difficult to tell. I have a question. So say um, if I know someone who is doing research on um, coming up with innov innovative ways of um, having more environmental friendly agricultural production, um, how, how does that go then to finding um, the type of investors you're talking about? I just have, it's, it's probably a very basic question, but um, I was just thinking in my mind, I do know someone who mentioned to me the other day of a way that it's quite efficient in producing um, things that could be like um, very innovative, but then how do I enable that person to talk to, um, you know, climate ventures? And so they've, they've, they've got a company which is, which, is gonna, um, which is gonna change the way agriculture is done in a particular sector. Have they? Have they got a company or is it, is it an idea? No, no, no. It's like an academic, a full-time academic. Because we're both academics and we've got friends in engineering and, you know, we talk about what you're doing these days and just one of the conversations strike me as pretty cool. And when you're talking about it, it just, just suddenly occurred to me, but they're not interested in going into industry full-time. So how they get investors, for example, how can I hook them up? Um, so this, um, let me see if I understand your question correctly. Um, what, so you're, you're not asking how can they get involved in, in startups, you're, you're asking how, no. can they, how can they contribute to, to the field of, of getting people to move to Green Ag. Um, there's a few ways. One, one is um, VCs are always looking out for expert advisors. Um, that we, you know, as if, if, you're, if you're an early stage VC, you, you've got to look at a thousand decks, maybe 2000 decks a year. And so sometimes you're seeing things and you, you, you look at this company and you think, I can tell, I, I know how to assess whether this is a good company, but I, it's difficult for me to assess whether this is going to, whether this idea will work, whether it will have a positive impact on the climate. And so if I, if I, get, if I get decks uh, about nuclear power, I know who to ask. Uh, if I get decks about sustainable fashion, I know who to ask. But um, there's, there's not enough researchers in ag who are, um, who are, um, advisors to VC firms. So, that, so that's one way. Um, just put his hand up and say, I'm, you know, I'm a researcher in this area. Who wants, you know, who, which VCs are interested in speaking to me? Um, or you can send them to me and I will, I will, I will introduce them. That's, that's one way. The, the other way is, is getting on a board of, uh, of existing companies. So they're, um, you know, they're advisors to individual companies and that could be quite remunerative um, if, if they were to do that. Um, yeah, those, those yeah, but th there are some like patent issues so you know issues with patent and stuff so it could be quite complicated but yeah yeah thanks the, the the area that their patent is in will be will be very very um focused won't it but they they will still know more than like 99.999 percent of people about about agriculture in general won't they mm -hmm. and the technology they're developing yeah because they do work with say an existing group of people, um, but they're developing that particular technology. And I was just thinking they 
if they want to make it bigger, they do need investors. They do want to work with industry, and we would be a very effective way of them finding, you know, proper investors because they probably also don't have the experience nor the time to vet all the um, companies that are interested to work with them either. So do, does, does this, does this, your mystery friend, do they, do they want to remain an academic then? Yeah, 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 very much so. so how do they want, want, want to be commercialized? Is, is this your question? How, how would they commercialize their idea? Not even commercialized, but finding proper, proper, um, industrial partners or um, investors to further fund their ideas because it is quite expensive to run experiments and you know to um, just do research in general yeah, so, yeah. I mean there, re research is, is not really my, my field but mm -hmm. um, you know this I mean there's way more government grants available now than, than there ever have been um, mm -hmm. and then of course there's um, you know, re research in private companies. Sorry, I don't know more about uh, academic research and its funding. No worries. Um, I, I guess I had a little bit more of a general question. Uh, you talked about uh, how you 10x your income and uh, one of the things you said was due to one of your connections. So how, how did you personally uh, foster these connections? How, how did you build these connections? And in turn, how, how can I make sure that uh, I can build uh, more connections more effectively with other people or people uh, in the entrepreneurial field, I guess. It's, it, sounds, it sounds almost too obvious, <laughs> um, but I, I suppose my, the three things that I do is, you know, I try, I try to be really friendly with everybody and useful to everybody, um, regardless of, you know, even, even if, you know, I, I assume most of my interactions with people are not going to be useful to me, but if I'm useful to them, then my, my network starts to grow. And eventually it's surprising how, it, you know, it, it starts to come back around. Um, and the third thing is be curious about everything. You know, whoever you meet, this is, this is what I do. Whoever I meet, if I bump into somebody on the train, oh, hey, who are you? What do you do? Oh, really? What's that like? You know, what, what are you working on at the moment? What problems are there with that? What, what opportunities are there? You know, what, what do you like about your job? What do you hate about your job? That kind of thing. Oh, no way, you're, you're doing this. Are you, have you, do you know this person? Can I give you an introduction to this person? So I've, I've you know, I'm just, I've realized that I just really, really love networking. And that hasn't always been the case. You know, I used to be a massive introvert. Um, and I thought networking was, you know, like schmoozing. It was, there was something, there was something um, not immoral, but kind of distasteful about it. But now I realize, no, it's helping other people. And if you can do whatever you can to help other people, then eventually it does come back around. That might, that, you know, that might not sound like a very satisfying answer. But what, what I found is the more that I help other people, the more, uh, the more people ring me up and say, hey, Pete, do you know about this thing? Um, and I, 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 when, I, when I started looking at a deal flow, for example, I had to go to a lot of trouble to meet entrepreneurs who were working in this space. And now I don't need to anymore. Now more people contact me than I've got, you know, than, than, I, than I need. It's great. So I think I think being being a networker is is um, again I'm going to use this phrase like increasing your your surface opportunity your the surface area of your opportunity space because um, it will always it, it it's so much better never never go in through the front door that's that's another thing you know if somebody says oh this is great service you should use this great service I always ask do we know anybody who works there or do we know anybody who's invested and let me speak to them give me a personal introduction. Um, that makes sense. Thank you. Never going through the front. Never going through any front door. Always look for a side door. <laughs> it's funny that I'm saying this, you know, because I, I used to I used to be a programmer. You know, I used to wear wear sandals and socks <laughs> and uh, and sit in my darkened room uh, doing Python all day. And you know, I used to love that. But yeah, helping mm -hmm. other people is 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 a really great route to opening the door to great new opportunities. It's interesting how many questions there are about 10xing your, your income. I don't think that should be the question. <laughs> quite, uh, yeah, how to 10x your income. It sounds like uh, one of those YouTube videos that everyone... Yeah, if you don't know about that, go, go on to Clubhouse. They, they talk about that all the time on, on Clubhouse. <laughs> <laughs> my, I've, my, my cousin's just got back from, um, from Canada, my nephew, and, um, and he, his quality of life um, 
really makes me a little bit jealous because he used to work. So he was he was a, a programmer like me, um, and he used to work two hours a day because he he worked in an area where his um, where his income was quite high, but he kept his his costs really low, and so he he was able to run loads of experiments. You know, do do lots of side hustles. Get, if it was shining, you know, he'd he'd go out rock climbing, and um, you know that's the kind of the Tim Ferriss route, isn't it? Have you guys read Tim Ferriss? The uh, the four hour work week. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, it's amazing, but yeah. Yeah, it is amazing, isn't it? It's so you know I I think there are two paths. There's a Tim Ferriss path which is where you're living, you're working to live, right? So you're trying to work at minimum amount of time possible in order to live your life to the full. So he, you know, he will, he will work four hours a week, for example, for a while, so that he can use the money that he's got to drink the best wine, to go to, he does crazy things like, hey, I want to learn to dance. I'm going to fly to Buenos Aires. I'm going to live there for three months without working. And I'm going to get the world's best tango dancers to teach me how to dance tango. And then at the end of that, I'm going to enter a competition a global national competition uh, for, for tango. That's, that's the Tim Ferriss route. Um, the other routes, uh, I call it the Ray Dalio route, which is where, you know, you, you, instead of thinking that we're, which is the live to work route, where you get all of your meaning in life out of, out of work. And Ray Dalio, who runs one of the world's top hedge funds, his book Principles talks about how you can optimize for, for having maximum impact in, in the work that you do so that you get the satisfaction that you want out of life from your work and I've you know I've kind of lived both and at the moment I'm, I'm in the Ray Dalio camp but it's it's fun to try both. Can I just ask in terms of the uh, the finance side um, so I was listening to someone from the Green Investment Group recently so one of the challenges with getting investment into into um, climate solutions is because it's such a fertile sector now and there's so many there's so many unknowns and so many new solutions coming about that say um, you've got investment in like um, wind energy, but then you also know that at some point that might become obsolete if if there's you know cheap hydrogen energy and it's all it's 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 always got the potential for a cheaper and newer solutions coming about. So how how do you do do you tend to see that as a challenge or do you factor that into um, your decisions? We, we find that less of a challenge. So we're, we're, we're an early stage startup and our, our thesis is um, the VC is broken and VCs don't know what they're talking about. But um, I think that's what, the, that's what the data show. If you, look at, if you look at how many deals VCs have made over the past 40 years and how many of them have been successful, you can't put your hand on your heart and say the best VCs know how to pick them. Like even the best VCs in the world who, who you know, who are, who are in Google and Facebook and all of that kind of thing really early on, you look at their track record and they've got, you know, maybe, maybe 200 investments in clean tech that all went to zero. So we, we all, all VCs all, all pick a load of bum companies. That's, that's just the, that's the deal. So we've kind of, we've kind of embraced that and said, well, let's look at the maths of how many, how many companies that you invest in, how many companies out of those over the past 40 years have, have gone to the moon? And, and probabilistically, how big does your portfolio need to be and what kind of companies do you need to invest in to make sure that there's one or two unicorns in your, in your portfolio? So that's, that's why we personally are saying um, we're going to do 120 deals in three years. We're going to invest in everything that moves and we're going to weed out the ones that we know are not going to go to the moon because we believe we can't tell which ones are going to go to the moon. And, you know, that, that's, that's not a very satisfactory answer, but there are people at, other end, at the other end of the scale who, who will employ a whole team of 50 people to, to kind of, hello, to kind of research, uh, there's a baby, I wave at it, um, to kind of research, you know, the business model and the, the founding team and that kind of thing. Um, they don't have any better results. So we, we, we don't know what, you know, what's, how it's gonna shake out. We, in, in Britain, we've kind of, we're betting big on hydrogen, aren't we, which is, which is unusual. Other, other nations are betting big on, on batteries. Batteries might be a better solution. But in the UK, we're saying, you know, the government is saying we're going to do hydrogen. So what we what we know is there's going to be a lot of activity in hydrogen. It might ram into a wall, but let's invest in a bunch of those and, and see what happens. So, yeah, diversity, diversity, diversity. Oh, perfect. Cheers. Just building on that, why are you so interested in like seed and early seed companies when like a more established company would probably... Well, there's a higher chance of it being successful, right? Because it's already selling. This, um, let me know if the kids in the background crying is a, is a distraction. Can, can, can you hear kids crying in the background? Because mm -hmm. if you can, I'll, I'll go on mute. Um, 
it's it's two things and the main the main one is i i am first and foremost a climate activist i got into this because i i think we need to fix the climate and i think in order to do that we need to create a whole load of innovation so i'm involved with accelerators and incubators and i'm doing everything i can to waft the flames of, of entrepreneurship um if you if you go later stage then there are far fewer companies and you know it gets it gets uh, it gets more and more kind of solidified as you get later and later stage all of the innovation is happening at early stage isn't it and um that risk that i was talking about how we need to get comfortable with uh, we need to get ourselves into a position where we're comfortable with risk i think we need to do that as a as a species as well we need to try we need to try lots of things that fail um if we're going to find the, the massive breakthrough technologies so that's that's the first reason because we need to um uh we need to find new ideas that are going to change the planet. You can only do that by, by investing in early stage. Um, and the second reason is because early stage venture is the, you know, it's, it's the most, it's the most profitable. If you look at everything, early stage venture is the most profitable. Um, and, and even if you, if you, if you move from pre-seed up to seed or seed up to a, you know, the, your, your returns drop dramatically, you've got to be in it for the long term. So, you know, my, my game is an eight to 12 year, gamble I'm, I'm not going to know until 12 years whether i was right or not um that's but that's that's the that's the early stage vc game uh, i've got one question uh, so you talked about you being uh, going towards the real value route uh, so just wondering do you have any principles that you look at when you want to invest in certain companies or principles that help you decide which company you want to invest in um, I do. I don't. I don't think I get them from Ray, Ray Dalio. I, Ray, the Ray Dalio principles I, I used to live my life. Um, um, the the print. I mean, and the principles. The principles. What you what you see in, in any in any book. But it's. Um, I think that the team. Again, it's it's kind of almost redundant to say so, but the, the team are almost more important than anything else. So the market is important. When when I look at a company, I think is this market either big or, or going to grow exponentially over the next few years? Could it be a big market? That's important. But I think more important is the problem and the team. And you can you can learn so much just by listening to the founder talk about the problem space for five minutes. You know, that's if you've got to look at 2000 companies in the in a year, then all VCs are going to have these heuristics that, that they that they're, they're just kind of rules of thumb. Did, did, did the guy go to Harvard? Yes. Is he white? Yes. Is he a man? Yes. All right, sounds amazing. You know, they, those are the heuristics that unfortunately lots, lots of VCs apply. Um, we, we try to have other, other heuristics um, because what we learn from basic portfolio theory is that diversity is, is king. And if you're only in, investing in, in white men who went to Stanford in Silicon Valley, that's not going to be very diverse, is it? Um, but if you, if you listen to the founder talk about the, the, the problem space, then you you learn a lot about their their drive, how passionately they feel about. Are they in love with the problem? Are they in love with the problem? So you know, what's what's a good example of that? Um, people standing shivering outside a pub, wait waiting for a waiting for a taxi. Yeah, that's that's the problem. And Uber is 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 the solution. The guys the guys who founded Uber didn't start with that, but if you listen to them talking about this problem, they lived it. They were standing shivering outside a pub. Um, so we, what, what we, the heuristics that we use is, is that we listen to, do you feel like this, this person is just a killer and that they will go out and they will wrestle with this problem until the problem goes away? Because if they are, even if their idea is bad, it doesn't matter because they'll find that out pretty soon and they'll pivot and they'll do whatever it takes to, uh, to get there. So we talk about investing in billion, billion dollar founders. So people who just, they're great. And you know, maybe they're not great in, in, a, in a typical way. Maybe they don't have a degree. I don't have a degree, so I've got to be open-minded. Um, but are they, you know, are they super motivated and do they love the problem? Thank you. Yeah. Um, I've got a question regarding like markets at the moment, um, especially like investments. Um, so you, you read a lot about SPACs and obviously SPACs are like, for later series, maybe like CDs, you know, um, but there's lots of talk that it's a bubble, right? And if all these SPACs uh, for these exciting companies are a bubble and it all fails, how will that affect your business for early, early stage investments? Or do you think they'll be okay? 
that, that is that is a good that is a good question. Um, there is there is a you know it does really feel like there's a bubble at the moment, um, and spacs and things like that are, are a consequence of that. I think they're a consequence of the fact that you've got all of this money flowing into the system, you've got all of these companies growing growing big, and we've got you know it's currently very slow to to exit a company to IPO a company, um, and so it definitely feels overheated. Um, and it's it's gonna it's gonna slow down. And so you know, early stage VC, there are new VCs popping up all the time. Right, I, I started my VC firm about four or five months ago. Since then, they, several others have. You know, they, we're, we're, I'm part of a wave. You know, I I, I recognise that. Um, but if if you look, okay, so going back to Ray Dalio a sec, he's done an amazing video on the mi ma macro and micro cycles uh, in the economy. And um, if you if you look at that, it's it, it feels like this is not a short-term thing. It's not a one-year, two-year thing. It's a seven-year, eight-year thing. And he calls this the, you know, the lost decade um, when both the micro and micro cycles are right, the, right in the trough. So it's, it's a bubble. I, I do agree that it's a bubble. But I'm trying to make hay while the sun shines. Because um, soon, it's, it's like, do you remember in the, in the dot-com boom when everybody was investing in, you know, if you've got, if you've got, if you've got pets.com, anything dot-com, people would invest in you. Um, when that bubble finally burst, um, what was left? It was the things that were, that were quality that had some, sub sub some substance. So I'm trying to establish myself as a player who invests in things that have some substance. I could just go out and invest in any, any company that does climate with an NFT. Like we meet companies that are do, doing planting trees, give you an NFT that represents that tree. Oh man, it's frothy as nobody's business. So if I was just doing all of that, then when the bubble burst, I would also burst. That's why I'm trying to make sure that you know there's there is substance in my deals. All right, uh, thank you very much. I think I think uh, we're approaching seven. So, um, if anyone has any last burning questions, uh, yeah, we've got a few minutes left. Um, all right, I guess this is it. Thank you very much, Pete. It's been a pleasure having you. Uh, really insightful. Uh, I, I think we all are leaving uh, this having learned quite a lot. But yeah, I think yeah, someone... on LinkedIn. Um, so Pete, Pete Denny, there's only one Pete Denny on LinkedIn, uh, at least. Uh, if you want to connect with me on uh, on LinkedIn, I'd, I'd be delighted. Because, um, you know, my, my, my crazy dream is that, is that you guys will go and start uh, startups um, around the world. And, uh, and then, you know, me and my friends will get to invest in you. That's uh, <laughs> what I'd love. I'm, I'm really interested um, in in what uh, Mechlet and Sabre are going to do next. I'm watching your careers with interest. <laughs> Listen, thanks all for having me. It's been a pleasure. Um, stay in touch, you, you crazy kids. All right. Thank you very much, Pete. Bye. Thank you.